What is up, everyone? Welcome to another episode of Lou Reviews. I'm your host, Luis Jimenez. Thank you all for being here. Welcome to the destination for critical thinking in the realm of the unexplained. My name, again, is Luis Jimenez. If you haven't already, hit the like, share, subscribe, and ring that bell buttons. That way you are notified when we go live, and we do it often these days, and very on schedule. The schedule is streams often, so it is imperative that you ring that bell. And if uh, you don't, you can catch some repeat. Either way, if you absolutely love, love, love this show, love this content, check out our Patreon link in the description below. All right, you guys. Boy, interesting few days since uh, Friday. Uh, man, oh man, oh man. What's going on, everyone in the chat? Simon Fly, Daniel Boone, Sandra McDonald, John Hunsley, Liz G, Complizier. 
Lord Ludacris, R. Wolf, Michael Huntington, Bobby Broadway. Guys, welcome. Welcome, welcome, welcome. I am so stoked all of you guys are here. Uh, let's get started with today's show, shall we? Um, let me go ahead. Boy, oh boy, oh boy, where do we start? Um, well, today's mainly about Ross Colthart, but I wanted to go over a couple of clips before we dive into Ross. So uh, stay tuned for Ross. We'll get there in a second. Uh, the first thing I want to do is highlight a couple of things. Uh, so the first, well, actually, yeah, I'm not going to use this clip. I'm not going to use this clip. We'll only, we'll only cover one of these things. Um, and then we'll come back maybe next, next show and discuss the other thing. I just don't want to, I don't want to, you know, promote terrible people and terrible sites. <laughs> um, let me, hold on a second. Let me see if I can quickly find, let me see. Okay, yeah, here we go. Excellent. So, never mind. We will talk about it. Uh, so, this is... Uh, let me go ahead and switch views here for you guys. Let's get to the good old Lou Reviews view here. Um, and let me fix something here real quick. Or this will drive me a little cuckoo for Cuckoo Pass. There we go. There we go. Excellent. Okay. Um, so this is a uh, Pulitzer prize winning finalist, um, and New York times bestselling author, Annie Jacobson. And she was on recently with, uh, Danny Jones on the Danny Jones podcast. And I'm going to go ahead and pop up the fair use here. This is transformative work. We are educating the public on the videos that we are sharing. This is covered under fair use and allowable by law. I'm also going to include, uh, let me go ahead and do that right now. I'm going to include the link to the full interview in the description below. Sorry, probably, at, well, you know, not that sorry. I just, um, I just decided to do this show, so it was very on, off the cuff, this show right here. So I don't have everything ready, but this full link is in there. So if you want to check out the full interview, please do. Uh, there was a very interesting moment, and I'm not sure how long this moment goes on. Looks like about six minutes they talk about UFOs. And uh, there is a moment in here where... He, they talk about the disinformation aspect of it. So let's listen to the clip and see what we think. Let me go ahead also and turn this up and turn up the screen for you guys so you guys can hear it. So let's get into it. Of that we might not know about. Like what was it? Was there anything that was not declassified? You know, there's, there's, you talk about, there's a scientist named Rydell, I think mm, his name was, mm -hmm. who was obsessed with flying He was flying obsessed to with UFOs, moon. yeah. Oh, he, he was also with obsessed with UFOs. Oh my God, he was a real sore in the, in the, a thorn in the side of the government because he came here and he joined a UFO club. Oh, really? <laughs> mm-hmm. And he would, and then he and his friends were doing UFO hoaxes. I write about this in Area 51 because it's, it was really interesting. Like, you know, most of them kind of stayed in line and were really interested in towing the, you know, American, the, the line of democracy and then, you know, advancing their careers. That really was the, the, the Nazis were nothing if, the former Nazis were nothing if they weren't ambitious. Right. But a few of them ran into, you know, trouble and Rydell was one of them because the government did not like that he was really interested in UFOs mm. and you know I mean we could talk for days about the UFO conundrum about, yeah, but we could <laughs> no. what mm. um didn't the Horton brothers come from Germany mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. they they designed the flying wing right, right. so right. Mm. um as I write in area 51 you know there was this search for all the different top Nazis that were developing weapons and weapon systems for the Reich. And the Horton brothers were among them. And they disappeared. They went to South America. 
they devi- they designed the flying wing, and if you look at pictures side by side of the flying wing and the B two bomber, I mean, they looks very similar, right? They just you're yeah, like, oh, intellectual property theft. <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> oh wow, that that bad. Well, yeah, Steve or Steve, yeah. pull up the uh, yeah. the yeah. There you go. <clears throat> Right. And then Horton. You, type in Horton. Type in Horton Flying Wing. Yeah, Horton Flying Wing. And then there was some sort of story. There was a story in Area 51 uh, where somebody went to interview the Horton brothers and they were like, any questions about CIA, we will not we yeah. will not say a mm-hmm. word about CIA. Mm-hmm. Why do you think that was? I mean, my theory on a lot of this is that time reveals all things. There's a There's a... There's a quote that I start the Area 51 book with that I'm forgetting right now, but um, you know, by the old Greek philosopher Horace, and it's exactly that, that like that which is hidden inevitably gets revealed. Mm. And I think that what's so interesting being a reporter, non writing about nonfiction as I do and others, like Tom O'Neill, who's been on your show, who's yeah. a friend of mine, right? Mm-hmm. You know, you just start to... On, you're peeling back layers of this enigmatic system of secrets right. and why and and it's like a ball of yarn it just gets bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and that's certainly the case with UFOs and it you could almost say the Horton brothers are the um, origin story I believe of ufology hmm. you know flying saucers right they actually created a aircraft that looks exactly like a flying saucer. I have a picture of it in uh, in the Area 51 book. It's a circular, oh, it, you know. I, I listened to the audio. I didn't yeah. get the photos. So this is like, you know, and then what comes first, the chicken or the egg, right? You know. Mm, yeah. What mm. did do? Can we find a picture of it? I would love to see it. Horton Brothers flying saucer, Area 51. Mm. We can find it online. You think? Yeah, there it is. Right there, the national. They took the yeah. Is that it? Right That's there. That's from my book. Yes. Oh yeah. wow. That I got at the National Archives. Well, that doesn't really look like a flying saucer. Uh, I think I guess from I one mean, angle it mm-hmm. does. It's a no, the one right saucer. here. The the one wing. The one wing. Oh, right? that. Down below, right here. No, no, no. Yeah. Right. Where we to where the we're right. pointing at? Yeah. See, it says arrow stories. Horton oh my brothers, God. two brothers, that one thing wing. It is yeah. so futuristic yeah. looking. It's right? crazy. I mean, that was 1941 mm. or two, wow. right? Right. Oh, it burned. Yeah, it burned. I yeah. mean, I, the thing that I think is interesting is like that you can, that the human mind can write the narrative that it needs to, right? So mm. if you believe, if you want to believe, then you write that, and when I say write, I mean that, you know, figuratively, not mm. necessarily literally. You just, that's, your reverse engineering from this idea of, you know, aliens exist or UFO, UFOs exist, right? right? And then and then everything leans toward that and fills that narrative in. And if you're on the other side of it and you are suspicious of that, you know, everything, I mean, look, I learned when I was the on my first book, Area Fifty One. I learned about this concept from this from officers of the CIA about and there are two forms of strategic deception. Yes. Okay, there is cover, right, and that's to try you know to essentially have a cover story like information, like Billy Wall jogging through cub- exactly. or uh, cartoon. <laughs> that's right. That's one kind of strategic deception, but the other kind is misinformation right and so it's and and the example i use in the area 51 book was a bunch of the lockheed engineers were heading out to area 51 to work on the u2 spy plane this is in the middle of the 50s and of course it was the most classified project or one of them that existed at the time right i mean the soviets could not know we were building a spy plane that could fly seventy thousand feet in the air above where their surface to air missiles could shoot them down for the purposes of spying on the Soviet Union to find out what was going on below, right? That's what the U-2 was. It was just absolutely this ingenious idea of like aerial espionage. That is the origin story, the birth of it, right? Right. Um, Right. (laughs) So it's so top secret. 
And they all get on the plane, and the plane crashes into Mount Charleston. Oh, my God. And everyone's dead. Oh, yeah, there was one guy who missed the flight, right? Yeah, that I interviewed, Bob Murphy. Yeah, oh. He got drunk and missed the flight. God. Yeah. Right? Can you imagine the guilt? Right? And so he... So they're all dead, and then the CIA is like, oh, shit, our program's going to be exposed. It's this, like... Oh, uh, right. You know, all the reporters are taking off up to tr- get up the road and they cover, you know, they c- c- cut off the road so that you can't get up there, but still it's going to leak out. And then the press reports a story that they were all scientists working on a secret atomic bomb out at Nevada test site. Wow. And, you know, the CIA's like, no comment, right? In this mm. sort of mysterious way. And they're like, see, it is. And then, so that's, there you have disinformation, right? right? It's just cool. like, and a lot of times what the agency does, in my experience, my understanding from people explaining this to me and from reporting stories and looking at history is they use the public's perception what we, or you, what you could say the public's gullibility mm. in some cases. And right. they use that to their advantage, you know, sometimes it spirals out of control and they can't control it. But often strategic deception is part of the – is is how the public reacts to something, yes. right? And one of the most eye-opening stories to that me is, is how these <laughs> – I think there were I mean, CIA – I that is pro- amazing. And why wouldn't the CIA or any other government entity for that matter use – the gullibility of the public and UFOs to hide everything, <laughs> anything, all of it. And simply just by denying it when the question is asked, boom, the imagination just does the rest of the work. The lore, the mystery does the rest of the work for them. They don't have to do anything else. And it's interesting that this interview, not interesting in like a conspiratorial way, but it is wonderful that this interview came out at the exact same time that Ross Colthart is completely unhinged right now uh, when discussing the, you know, the Arrow report and sort of uh, the interviews that he's doing to combat all of the facts that this silly narrative that has taken the advantage of the public's gullibility is doing. They are playing absolute defense on this. And the statements from Lou Elizondo, the the just barrage of interviews that Ross Coulthard is doing right now to play defense for this narrative. It's wild to me that a guy like Jay from Project Unity does not see that and does not go, hmm, I wonder why he's doing all that. And now he's, and we'll get into it, but now he's pushing religious movements. Um, and the interview he just did today with Danny Sheehan was just an absolute train wreck, train wreck of terrible information. And there was 10,000 people watching. <laughs> it was nuts. It was absolutely nuts. Uh, but let's listen to what the rest of Annie has to say about this. A pilots that were testing like the first jet airplane, mm-hmm. the first fighter jet over Nevada, they would bring gorilla masks mm-hmm. in the cockpit with them. So if another pilot came within a visual distance, they put on their gorilla mask. That way, when this guy goes to dinner with some buddies or goes to the bar, no one's going to believe he saw a gorilla flying a jet plane. Right. That is bizarre. And that's so similar. I mean, it, it makes perfect sense in Bob Lazar's story. If he's going to work on some shit and they, they put a little alien dummy in the window... To make it seem like, okay, no one's going to believe Bob Lazar if he says he saw an alien. But that kind of, that kind it, of backfires because a lot of people do believe that. And again, it depends what camp you're in that right. you revert, you, that story will work for your story, right? Which, mm, is, yeah. which makes it all very interesting. It's why I will never like sort of, I mean, I know my position. I really believe that the, that the whole hoo-ha about all of this is part of a major strategic deception campaign. Yeah, What's going on here. right now? 
Yes, thank you, Wendy Meyer, for the subscription. Going on. Really appreciate it. Um, thank you very much, Wendy Meyer, Meyer, new subscriber. Thank you. Uh, but sure, you did not want that, but thank you. Um, this is the very interesting part. This is the part that I wanted people to pay attention to because this is, to me, very important. Um, what she's talking about here, and in, in in reference to UFOs and how this is a massive deception campaign. Now, I think the question becomes after this is, or to what end? To what end is this disinformation campaign for? And I don't think there is one end. I think it's got multiple ends. <laughs> multiple. It's a hydra of reasons as to why. It's a. It's a you know, a can of worms uh, reasons as to why uh, a misinformation campaign like this could be happening. Uh, and then on the spectrum of this, you got people like Danny Sheehan uh, on the opposite spectrum. That is what people like Danny Sheehan saying things like, you know, this is against the law, a lawyer saying that running disinformation campaigns against the American public is against the law. It's not. And that's something that came in the Obama era. So this idea that uh, the you know American organizations uh, run by you know American governmental organizations, offices like the CIA, DIA, uh, NHA, NSA, you know the alphabet soup. Any one of these can launch a disinformation campaign. So, I mean, you know, you hear, like, again, you just get this story of Danny Jones talking about pilots putting on fucking gorilla masks just in case a pilot gets too close. So when he goes to Chili's the next weekend and he starts talking to his friends, guys, you would not believe what I saw. Shit. I'm pretty sure it was a top secret plane, but the thing that was weird was gorillas were flying it. What? And then the whole conversation is nothing about gorillas flying top secret planes or God forbid a UFO. Well, my God forbid, or even better a UFO. If you're, if you're talking from a government perspective, it's just absolutely wild. Absolutely. wild. cosmic Judas in the house. Thank you for being here. She has the best voice for audiobooks. She does. She's got a great voice. Uh, I wonder if she reads her audiobooks. I'm sure she does, right? Coldheart is. Oh, speaking of great audio voice books, Coldheart has got a great audio voice book. You know, he is an absolute shill. <laughs> the whole hoo ha about all of this is part of a major strategic deception campaign. What's and going on right now? Yes, and it has been going on since 1947, since the wow. CIA was created. I mean, you can read in Area 51, the original concern of then CIA director Walter Beadle-Smith, Beadle right? right? That right. Con his concern with like, this UFO, Chris, I mean, I quote the documents from the archives, right? That it's like going to cause a problem. And we need to use this, you know, I'm paraphrasing again, but this, so this was happening in 1947 and you can just chart, at least I can, um, how this is a repeating story. Now, many people, you know, take me to task over that. And I've interviewed for my book, Phenomenon, many of the, mm. of the individuals who are at the fore of this thrust to mm. say that the U.S. government is hiding alien technology. Now, for, what do you think? Sorry, go, go ahead. Well, to me, it's like, and I've interviewed all of them, and you know, I've written about what they have told me and their opinions about things. And so, do you do do they change their mind? Are they part? You know, are they part of the strategic deception campaign? Are some of them? I mean, excuse me, I sit back and look from afar. That's maybe my Tom O'Neill chaos book that's the 20 year, <laughs> you know, side reporting because right. it just keeps building and people continue to contact me about this and that. And it just gets more and more interesting. And also, as the science and technology grows, right, now you have threaded into all of this um, 
these new issues about DNA, about, um, you know, about things that didn't exist. Right. Uh, or they certainly existed, but that didn't, <laughs> didn't exist within the narrative. Yeah. 60, 70 years ago. Right? That, what do you, Gary what about Nolan. DNA? You know, being in like this idea that people that have experiences are different and they have right. different DNA. I mean, I get oh. into that in the end of Phenomena, but, it, you know. I, I, that's the one I haven't read yet. Yeah. I mean, I'm a storyteller. I'm a reporter, and I'm a storyteller, and I'm really interested in stories. And yeah, I'm really well, I'm buying a book today. <laughs> in how people, you know, we all, we, how you live your life. And, you know, Joan Didion said, we, we tell ourselves stories to live. Right. Right? Right. And also, many of the people I know that are involved in that world <coughs> have had what are called near-death experiences, right? And the phenomena. Yeah. And if you've had a near-death experience, to my eye, you are in a different category of human being, right? Because you've had hmm. an experience that others simply can't relate to, right? And I'm talking about like, you know, like particularly in war, most of the, most of the people I know that have shared with me, they're really intense, like I should have died story, right? Right. That's really intense. Yes. That's an experience that, whew, right, is going to change your thinking, right? right? <laughs> I, I, I have a lot I want to ask you about yeah. that, but I want to stay in the UFOs for a second. If I thought you... we were going back to paperclip. <laughs> <laughs> First, we got a new surprise kill vanish. Then okay, we're gonna get it back by to... the way, let um, me just say this is like these are the moments that I love the Danny Jones podcast when he's got and and look, I it's so difficult for me to be. Critical of this. Because he interviews everybody, anybody, and he asks good questions. So when he interviews a Danny Sheehan or he interviews, you know, um, you know, place in crazy person here, I, I'm, I'm blanking on some of the interviews that he's done, you know, Ashton Forbes. Um, on the opposite end of that, he's got an Annie Jacobson on. You know, to sort of to even things out. Personally, I enjoy these so much moments like this where you're asking someone who's actually done investigative, deep, deep, deep investigative uh, journalism into the most top secret facility on the planet and the stories that she's gotten. And she's walking away from this going, yeah, this is a lot of smoke and mirrors, and there are sprinkles of it that are super interesting. But to me, I've like I think she's sort of hinting at the science and technology aspect of the last 20, 30, 40 years that have now been infused into the military hardware aspect um, are going to create stories like that. Just why? I mean, I, I and I'm halfway through a live stream that um, Element, uh, Emily Louise did. Uh, Weird reads with Emily. If, uh, go check her out. Just Google and you'll find her channel. Uh, but they were discussing, and I want to dive into this more. The idea of the CIA and and everybody's heard about this. You know, where they in third world countries. They run all sorts of crazy operations that they would never dream of doing here. Like, if you think MK Ultra was bad, you should listen to some of the shit that they were doing in Peru or Brazil or any countless of uh, country in in South America. And uh, the one thing that I found incredibly interesting is that they have you know, the fact that well, first of all, a lot of experiencers have. Uh, um, a history of doing hypnotherapy, which is a big red flag. Um, but the idea of being able in the 60s, being able to spray a, um, 
a, a, a spray, right? That could intoxicate somebody, basically knock them out. And, but at the same time, still awake and you can feed them ideas and literally implant ideas in their head and then just push them out the van and say, all right, later. We're not even do that. Just push them out the van and drive away. And a lot of these stories that came out of these people are abduction stories. Oh, so weird. And how cattle mutilations were stories that were propped up by our own government to get farmers to sell their land in fear that their cattle would be mutilated. Besides just copycat people, people trying to get famous in the 70s and get on their local news station by, by desecrating a cow, you've also got that aspect on top of it now too. And I cannot wait to dive into those things on her channel because she's done some insane research on this. And there's some, I, I didn't realize the books that have been written on these things. Uh, so I'm excited to sort of open this new chapter of ufology for myself, because I think there are, again, the more I look into this, the more rational, reasonable explanations there are for almost all of this stuff. And yes, I am a skeptic now, but I also want to educate myself on all aspects of this. So that way, when the diamond in the rough if it does come, I'll be ready for it. I'll for sure, I'll, I'll be able to determine, hopefully fairly quickly, okay, this is something serious that we should seriously pay attention to, as opposed to, ah, that's just bullshit. Which is almost everything, pretty much everything. And the idea of, of you know, uh, I've always hung on to the idea, and I can't wait to have Emily on the show. I really can't. Um, and she's going to be on soon. We're, we're, we're coordinating a, a date now. Um, I would love to talk to her about Betty and Barney Hill. Because the thing that I've sort of hung my hat on for a long time, and there were other things that have changed my mind about Betty and Barney, um, and you know, I tend to lean that they are not telling the truth or it's not that they're not telling the truth. They've been convinced that the things they're saying are true. And the thing that I've always sort of hung my hat on is that Betty and Barney were an interracial couple in the late fifties and early sixties. And to just make up a story like that in that time in, uh, in American history would just be uh, almost suicide. I mean, it's already almost suicide to be an interracial couple at that time in the United States, but then you add that layer on top of it and it gets, uh, to me, in my opinion, would make their lives even more dangerous um, and more complicated in particular. And this idea that if you've got a sprayable device that can knock people out fairly quickly and you're able to abduct them, insert ideas into their minds, number one, to test to see if it works and to see if, how and when and if and in what scenarios you could use this on your enemies. Um, but more importantly, to see, well, what happens if we just do it on a regular average schmo? And this idea that maybe you get a couple of agents within the CIA who hear about Betty and Barney Hill don't like the fact that Betty and Barney Hill are doing the things that they're doing and take it upon themselves to abduct them and insert absolute batshit crazy stuff into their head. And Betty being already sort of a believer or at least in, at the very least was into that subculture of UFOs and aliens and science fiction. Um, I never once for one second even considered that. I, I I know I've gone on a crazy just 
weird thing here, but this got me, it just got me to thinking about all of this and how all of these things are a lot more explainable than the prophets of profit will have you believe, or the, the UFO mosh pit will have you believe. There are so many rational explanations if you look for them. And, um, yeah, anyway, I could go on forever about the episode I'm watching right now about Emily. Uh, it, it, it was such a great one. It was her first live stream. So I'm excited for her. I'm sure she's going to get even better at it. Um, but yeah, it just, the things that they tell I mean, they talked about the Gulf breeze UFO, which is sort of the craft that I compare my sighting to, you know, and how UFO books were written and who they were written by and where all of this stuff comes from and originates and her talking about, yeah, the UFO lore basically comes from Nazi technology. <laughs> and then, and now you, you sprinkle on top of that special DNA, like, like, you know, uh, um, Ramirez, John Ramirez was talking about on our show twice how he went to not top secret classified meetings, but just open like at a fucking Holiday Inn CIA meetings where they're openly talking about alien DNA within humans. And how the aliens are going to be here in 2026 and how the, the, the people who have this, the chosen DNA are going to be the ones that ascend to, to greatness. <laughs> like it's so stupid. It's so, so silly. It really, really is. Um, but it's starting to all make sense how this spins out of control how this lore and how this lore sprinkled with truths and also sprinkled with very in some cases credible people with weird obsessions weird that are into weird subcultures like me <laughs> like you if you're watching this show we're all little weirdos on some level because we're here. We're talking about this. So on some level, I want I want this to be real. I'll never deny that. To deny that would just be would be uh, untruthful. It would just be very um, unauthentic. Is the word I was looking for. And I want this stuff to be real just as much as anyone else, but I just want the real to be real. <laughs> I want the there there to be a real real now. Confirmed real real. Instead of a there there. I need evidence. That's the bar now. And just going back to Danny Jones, like, I think it's really more helpful with someone with this much influence. It's so much more helpful for society when these are the conversations we're having about this topic. This is still really interesting. This is still super engaging. It's, it's, it's hitting on the fringe, which people love, but it's also fringe with a, really big dose of reality and and, and forget about it. it's not a dose it is literally a concrete fucking block that you tie the the fringe balloons to to make sure they don't go anywhere you know so yeah anyway uh let's get back to this here real quick she's almost done if you were to decide to start writing a book about the whole UFO phenomenon mm -hmm. in the America right now, and you would to start interviewing all your sources, do you think you would get the real story? I wouldn't write that book because that's opinion. And yeah. I don't want to write opinion. I want to write, I- I'm not gonna write that book because that's opinion. I'm not writing a UFO book. A UFO book is opinion. She nails it. She nails it. 
you know, and and I, I would just love to see a Ross Colthart sit at a table with this lady. And dare say in front of her, yeah, well, I'm in contact with a few employees of the UFO Legacy Reverse Engineer Program. Like, she'd be like, get the fuck out of here. That's the dumbest thing I've ever heard. Because if anybody's talking to them, it would be her. And you could bet your bottom dollar that if somebody like that, and I'm sure somebody like that has come to her who to claim, yeah, Annie, I'm part of the uh, legacy UFO reverse engineering program. And she's like, oh, that's interesting. I'd love to talk to you. And then they, they set up a meeting to talk and for hours and hours and hours and hours. And at the, I'm sure at some point, Annie stops the conversations and goes, you know, okay, so all of these things are very compelling. I see some of these things check out, uh, but can you prove any of this? What is the evidence? What is the program? Who's your boss? Uh, you know, what do you have pay stubs? Where is the facility located? Uh, how does the technology work? Um, who are your coworkers? Uh, you know, things like that, like genuinely whistleblow. You know, do you have any of these things, you know, and of course, being a journalist, she cannot release any of those things unless she's given permission as to on the record. But, you know, I can promise you, she, even if she did have those, <laughs> those kinds of, uh, if she did have those kinds of things, would she tease it like Ross Colthart? Mm. I'm going to say no, because she's a real journalist. She's going to wait to be able to confirm it through multiple, actually confirm it through multiple sources. And then with the okay of her, I'm sure, publisher, or if she has an editor, she's writing books, so she's probably, you know, but she still has an editor of some kind, uh, just to make sure that the publisher doesn't get sued. Um you know, so I don't know. I, I'm just, it, it's, I, I had to play this because this juxtaposed to Ross Colthart and the nonsense that he's been saying the last few days. I think we just, we need to tie those fantasy balloons and the lore balloons and the bullshit balloons to the concrete slab that is reality. And so, you know, if I was going to encourage Jenny Jones, I would say, please do more of this um, and don't give the platform to crazies that, you know, are crazies, because I know that Danny Jones has conversations with these people before they come on the show. I know he checks out their work before they come on the show. He does research before people come on his show. And that's why his show's so great. And that's why people watch it. And that's why I'm subscribed to it. Um, you know, so anyway, if you want to check out the full link or the, the full interview with Annie Jacobson on the Danny Jones podcast, the link is in the description below. So go check it out. Um, let me see if there's anything else that they're going to say here, which I think there is, but it's pretty much done. I do write. Here's this document. Here's that. There's document. no documents. That's the thing. There's there no are. hard. Absolutely. There's no hard evidence. Though. And, and and I think that's the long quest for me you know, mm. ultimately. Mm. And I also build trust um, with people who sit in that, that sit in that world, right? And, I, and in my experience also, as people get older and they come closer to meeting the maker, they, their perspective shifts on what is important and what they want to share and tell. And I think that's yeah. really interesting, you know, mm -hmm. in a completely legitimate way, right? I mean, even the nuclear war book, like these – getting someone like Leon Panetta to go on the record with me, getting some of the elder yeah. statesmen that I did. Why? Because they have grandchildren. Because they are – they 
They, right. as one of them said to me, we thought we had this covered, you know? Like, oh, we'd get through the Cold War with all these nukes. At one point, we had 30,000 nukes, 30,000 nuclear warheads. You know, and China had how many? They had like pretty close to that, right? No, Russia. 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 Um, they had in the 20s? Russia had the same. Russia's okay. always essentially once the once we became equals mm -hmm. in the in right. the early fifties, then you know it's been the same. So they had thirty thousand too. Today we have five thousand. They have five thousand. That's one thousand seven hundred of which are on ready for launch status, meaning. So out of five thousand seventeen hundred are ready for launch. Ready they can, for launch. They could go in a matter of seconds. They can go. I mean, a co some of them are you know have to come out of the sil out of the hangars for right. the bombers. But mm -hmm. the four hundred ICBMs in missile silos hmm. are take sixty seconds. That's why they call them Minutemen. Right. 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 The submarine launched ballistic missiles. <sighs> that just gives me chills. The handmaidens of the apocalypse. Right. Right. And so as people get older that have had access to super classified they um, want to say things material I think coupled with the fact of how rapidly the world is actually just changing culturally scientific right they people people feel the need to share stories to share information not to like spill the beans on national security, but just more of a, more of the people that I find interesting, it's like more they want to tell their narrative. They want to tell why I'm telling you this. Mm. Um, right. Right. And then it becomes a cautionary tale or perhaps it becomes a way for... Maybe leave the world a better place. Yeah. Or to reframe how we right. think about things. Right. Right. Which is, and here's the thing, like... Especially if reverse engineering programs and back engineering programs have been happening since UFOs have been crashing. So 1947. So since 1947, there have been easily, I would say in the thousands of people that have worked on these programs and that have worked on this technolo technology, assuming it actually is real, and you're saying only Philip Corso and a handful of other people are the ones who want to tell their perspective, tell their stories. And then when you actually go and look at their perspectives and stories, you find, oh, yeah, these are not actually the most credible of people. And they also have belief systems before telling these stories. Um, I think there would be a wave of people that would want to better humanity before they leave the earth that want to relieve themselves of the guilt of knowing that kind of information and being able to just again get that off their chest be able to tell that to everyone in a safe environment where they're not going to be punished for saying those things um you know, I think there would be so many, it would be so overwhelming that it would be really hard to ignore. And that's not happening. That is not happening. And I don't count uh, Jesse Marcel. Because I think Jesse Marcel was telling people on purpose that it was an alien craft to mislead the American people and also the Russians as to what crashed in that ranch in 1947. But yeah, anyway, I thought that's just so damn interesting. Such a great um, interview. So definitely go check it out, guys. Um, okay, so the next thing I wanted to briefly touch on was this clip. And I've been saying this for a while about um, uh, about Chris Bledsoe and the Bledsoe family as a whole. I mean, these guys have taken so many pictures, and I, I just I could not remember where the hell I saw this video in particular. And thank God Cosmic Judas found it, uh, and he posted it on his Cosmic Judas uh, surplus Twitter account. And he writes here, "Isn't it amazing how Chris Bledsoe's UFO overlord?" Is actually a is actually a seasoned RC plane aviator, 
quite unexpected. He doesn't mention it in the video, but if you take a look around his shop where he films his TikToks, you'll notice a plethora of plane parts. And it's true, man. Like it is absolutely true. So if you pause this video, he's got a couple RC boxes here. I can't tell 100% for sure if not they're planes, but he's got a plane sitting here on the ground. He's got a plane right here. He's got a plane up here in this damn thing. Let's play this video so, like, a little more. Like things are changing or shifting. The Here's another RC plane. On the table, there is a days. <laughs> a diagram of a plane that he's building and designing. Um, you, you can tell because it's got a wheel right here and it also kind of matches what's going on sitting up here. Um, and everybody, not everybody, but there's some people who are like, well, what's the big deal, Lou? Is a guy not allowed to have a hobby? Sure. Yeah, absolutely. He's definitely allowed to have a hobby. He can go fishing. He can fly as many fucking planes as he wants. But if he's on Fox News and he's on fucking documentaries and he's selling and his kids are helping him with this because he doesn't have the technological know-how. Um, and, and he's a CIA spook. Like he's essentially like been used by the CIA to put this bullshit story out about him being, you know, seeing a lady and being able to call orbs and and being on Fox News and, and saying this shit on on national television. Yeah, I think it's important that you point out to everyone and make it a make everyone aware that this guy works on RC planes every day of his life. Yes, I think that's relevant. <laughs> I think that's fucking relevant. <coughs> and all of his kids are into the hobby as well. So if you've got dad there with his contraption on filming a fucking documentary saying that he could summon orbs and one of his kids is two miles away with one of these drones strapped with a whole bunch of lights on it that change color. Oh man, look at that. It's the lady. Thank you for coming and showing up. Oh, thank you, Lord Jesus. And it's Ryan Bledsoe two miles away. All right, daddy, here we go. Like, that is not what I'm saying is happening, but that is a hell of a lot more plausible than him being able to summon alien fucking spaceships. And it is relevant that this guy is a hobbyist. And I wouldn't be, it would not shock me if like a lot of scam artists, they fall into this shit accidentally. Like he built a plane, he put some LED strips on it. He's like, hey, let's fly tonight. I bet it would look really cool. And then they fly tonight. He's like, hey, Paul, I, that looks kind of like a UFO. Hey, you know what there, Ryan? Little rye rye, you're right. It does look like you. You know, that kind of reminds me of a story of a lady that I met after she abducted me when I was part of the CIA programs. Ooh, wee. Wow. Let's call the History Channel and get them over here. You, you, you got it, Paul. Like, I uh, don't. <sighs> I'm sorry, it's relevant. It's fucking relevant. And it's also hilarious. It's hilarious, dude, that he's got a garage. Oh. Well, look at it, there's another plane hanging down. Dude, I count one, two, three, possibly four, five, six on the floor here, seven in the fucking rafter, and drawing a fucking plane here. I know there's way more. There's definitely some stacked in here. There's one, there's a wing hanging right here. It's really in deep thought. It's hard to say. It's um, hard to say. With all the things going on in the world. With all the things but going yeah. on in the world. <laughs> oh man, what a kooky, what a kook. What a kook. What a kooky dude. Kooky look. Okay, let's get the hell off of this. <laughs> Oh my god, no audio. But yeah, here he is. Look at him. Look at him with his look at look at that. You know you're an experienced 
uh, RC flyer when you could do three dimensional, then they call these 3D moves. I know this because I watch a lot of RC videos because I can't afford to actually be in the hobby. So I just watch the videos sort of serendipitous, you know, not uh, sort of not serendipitously, but uh, vicariously live through the people who can do it. And so, yeah, he's flying a plane completely vertical like that. Like, that's not an easy maneuver to pull off. Like, look at the size of his controller. This dude loves this shit. He lives for this shit. And he lives in a perfect part of the country where he can experiment with UFOs go flying above his house. And you guys just eating that bullshit up like it's like valid okay so ross colthart let's get on ross colthart uh so this was a tweet that stephen greenstreet had um brought to everyone's attention and i thought it was very interesting because this is right on par with stuff that ross colthart does um especially these days but this is just very this is a little blame, but anyway, he writes, UFO activists like News Nation and Ross Colthart are currently tweeting an image of what appears to be explosions and fire at the Pentagon. They're angry because a new Pentagon report says aliens aren't real. Colthart previously said people covering up UFOs should be stoned to death should be, oh, excuse me, stoned and their bodies dragged through the streets. So usually when you stone people or you call for a stoning of someone, you stone them to death. It doesn't say death, but I mean, it's kind of inferred. Um, the mainstream news media continues to completely ignore this simmering anger among religious UFO activists who haven't recently incre increased their unhinged, who have recently increased their unhinged, violent and warlike rhetoric. And that is also true. But let's take a look at what uh, Ross Coldhart tweeted. So he writes uh, 19 hours ago, and this is from the Liberate. This is an article from Liberation Times. An excellent application of Chris Sharp's withering blowtorch to DOD ex boss Sean Kirkpatrick. Bank bum. Bank him. Bank him. Bank him. <laughs> Arrow report. Endgame. The Pentagon establishes path to disaster following release of UFO report, and then he tags the Liberation Times. But this is the image that, that Liberation Times uses, and this is the image that Ross Colthart retweets out. And this is why I really don't like either one of these guys, and neither one of these guys are American citizens, but they've got no problem shitting all over uh, American policies and uh, sources and methods, and they love making up stories with no, with no proof, with no evidence whatsoever. That is their mo. But now they've got a picture of the Pentagon, which seems to be looks like it's getting blown up. Looks like these jets and planes are dropping bombs near the Pentagon. Um, you know, it's like, oh, well, what's the big deal? Again, what's the big deal, man? It's a big deal when these are the guys that are, you know, telling the UFO nutballs that all of this stuff is real and that there's people within the Department of Defense that are holding back this information. There's people within, you know, private industry that are holding back this information. They're gatekeepers. Yet Ross Colthart knows three or four people that know exactly where a craft so large, a crashed UFO craft so large, it couldn't be moved. They had to build a building around it. He knows where that is. He can tell everyone tomorrow. The world could be could be changed tomorrow at the snap of the fingers by Ross Coulthard, but he refuses to do it. But then turns around and has no problem with calling for the death of other people who are in government and in these private industries. He's calling for their death if they don't come out and tell the American people what's really happening and tell the world what's really happening. Even though Ross Coulthard knows exactly where, when, who, and what's happening. <laughs> like, uh, hello, hello, when do we, when, who's who, and when do we call for Ross Coulthard to be tied up behind a Humvee stoned and dragged through the streets? Who's gonna call for that one? And who's going to get offended when that happens? I'm sure it'll be a cadre of just UFO, you know, 
Green Street calls them activists. I think that's the wrong word to use, but I understand why he uses it because they are. They are activists. These are the guys that are uh, trying to drum up hatred, trying to drum up organization, trying to drum up uh, ill will for people within Arrow, people within their government, uh, you know, local and state representatives, um, you know, people within the community, like. So scientists within NASA, like it, there is no limit to where they sick this rabid uh, pack of, you know, UFO mosh pit dogs to sick. Like, and right now it's the Department of Defense. It's just wild. Um, so here's Ross Coulthart on uh, another, you know, on Danish, okay, so some of you have asked about the documentary Ross is referring to to the last part of our conversation. Appar uh, approximately one month ago, I departed for Greenland with my colleague and good friend, uh, Lassie Rebeck, to a documentary for Danish national TV. We've been receiving... I, mean, I know my position. Oopsies. You know what? I'm going to undo that one. We've been receiving reports about mysterious lights in the sky in a small village in the southern part of Greenland called uh, Narsaswak. Narcissuak, Narcissuak. Hmm. And indeed, the lights are for sure anomalous and mysterious. Weird thing seems to be going on near above the Arctic Circle. Okay, so this is just Start another... asking questions. I mean, your country is Here located this close is what to he the does, Arctic yeah. Circle, and that's where a lot of this activity is happening. I did a story last year about the fact that sources have told me that there were, I think, nine anomalous objects seen hovering on radar close to the Arctic Circle, which is oh. not too far from your neck of the woods. Um, US fighter jets happened to be at the area in the area at the time on an exercise and they were sent to intercept. And my sources tell me that the objects seemingly became aware of the approach of the fighters and long before they got anywhere near them, they disappeared in an instant. They flit, flitted out of sight. Um, this happens all the time. There sure. are these kind of engagements in that part of the world all the time. It's one of the most remote parts of the planet. And, um, you know, if if there is an NHI presence on this planet, you would <laughs> assume that those kind of barren wastes of empty land would be places where they could locate themselves. You love that. I love that when he does that. If, if, he always throws that in there. If, if, so that way he could have plausible deniability. I never said this stuff was real. I said, if, go back, check it. Go back and check it. And I, I mean, I, I pointed out that tactic a long time ago with Ross Coulthard. That's what he's known for. So here's Ross Coulthard on Fade the Black after the report. When they walked out. And let's, listen to this. I, I had listen a to the claims. This piece of shit makes <laughs> and that's a jeremy corbell quote because uh, you know jeremy corbell's the man right of one individual who told me that when they walked out of seeing one of the videos that they'd been shown in a secure skiff secure what is it it's a, a secure compartmentalized information facility one of the rooms that they use to brief congressmen and women and senators they said their world had changed because of what they'd seen. Now, the thing that I thought was most telling wasn't the reference to Roswell in Andre Carson's opening. It was the fact that the default video that they defaulted to was possibly, I'm told, the least interesting video mm -hmm. in the cupboard. That, that of all the of videos that they could have selected, they one, they weren't prepared. They hadn't actually provided a way to actually freeze on the object that they were saying was represented in that video, which was essentially a blurry metallic sphere that zooms by a, an aircraft, a fighter aircraft at high speed. The key issue was that was one of the least interesting videos, I'm told, of what the Congress has been shown. Why did they do that? Why did they deliberately pick a video that was the most banal, uninteresting of the lot? the one that gave the debunkers an opportunity to go, oh, is that the best you've got? Seriously, <laughs> this is not going to be more blurry videos, is it? 
when I'm told, I mean, I've spoken to people who've seen the 23 minute video, the, this apocryphal video that is apparently incredibly high definition, which shows a very clear structured Listen, listen to this again. Incredibly high definition. And I've, and I've spoken to people who've seen. I've spoken to people who've seen. 23 minute video. The 23 minute video. I wonder who he's talking about. When, and, and he's not lying, right? He's probably not lying because they've seen a 23 minute video, I bet. But I bet it's not of an alien spacecraft. There's no specificity as to what it is. It's just a craft that is must be alien i mean it's just it can't be human he's spoken to multiple people and so when he says that he means lou elizondo and chris mella that's who's confirmed it for him nobody outside of that has confirmed that for him i i will bet anything <laughs> anything video that this apocryphal except and you know i'm not going to count people like Tim McMillan at the debrief, like, don't want to talk about that. You know, it's got to be someone who's else who's actually had eyes and it, and will come out publicly and say, yeah, I've also seen the 23 minute minute. For video that is apparently incredibly high definition, which shows a very clear structured craft, a machine, a technological object in the air taken by a US military pilot detected by the way on multiple sensor systems incontrovertibly a solid object a piece of technology what i got worried about by the um the way the the hearing was conducted was i got the distinct impression that what the two witnesses were trying to do was walk back from the admissions that had actually been made by their own uap task force in june last okay so here's Ross Coulthart now. Damn, this was very interesting. Uh, <laughs> oh, man. Yeah, shit. I might have to play this clip here, too, just because it was so... St well, well, I, we I had a conversation to. We, could, with we could do that next week. Um, okay, so this is... So right after the air report dropped, I think one of the first shows that Ross Coulthart went on, and he and Gary Nolan appeared, not together, separately... Um, and they had an, oh, they were so upset about the air report. Uh, but this is a little bit of what Ross Goldhart had to say. Uh, now I referenced earlier in the analysis I did on, on this whole uh, report, uh, that legacy program gatekeepers have been advising Kirkpatrick. And we were one of the first people to, to reveal this months back that, mm. that Kirkpatrick had people that were actually managing or had been managing the legacy UFO crash retrieval and back in an engineering program <laughs> that he had brought those people on board to advise them. I think we've <laughs> kind of seen the result of that. And I understand earlier that you posted that you actually know the names of these people. Do you plan on revealing them? Yes, um, actually, I forgot it was you that had that scoop, Matt. It was you. It was the advisory group to Dr. Sean Kirkpatrick that he was keeping very, very secret. But there were, again, people in Arrow who were quite alarmed to discover that their boss, the head of Arrow, was taking advice from a group of advisors who, frankly, were totally and utterly compromised. And uh, <laughs> I can't name them just yet. I've got plans about what I want to do. But um, what I can tell you is that uh, these are people whom I know are directly involved as legacy program gatekeepers. One of them sat on the National Security Council with Dick Cheney in his White House years. It's very, very interesting to see the people who are now being revealed to me as the people involved in, frankly, this cover-up. And... Real quick, I just want to say thank you to Complizier. Lou, brother... Danny Sheehan, uh, she man, and Ross Pop-Tart had a one-hour News Nation clip like two hours ago. What the F, UAP. Yeah, we're going to go, we're going to actually dive into that a little bit. Uh, and uh, Pat Calabria with a little emoji, $5 donation. Thank you so much, Mike Drop. Uh, appreciate it, uh, the donation. I'll keep that one up a little bit. Um, let's listen to the rest of this. And yes, they are going to be named. They are going to be revealed. Oh, can't wait for that. unveiling of who these people are uh, in my own good time. Yeah. In my uh, own good time. Lot, there's an awful lot leaking Thank out of you, the Thank you, Sam. Sa right Sa now. Sa Sa and, 
for the subscription. Appreciate Look, it. As Gary said, these are dangerous times. These are desperate people. Gary they said. They are concealing. These I, are I mean, dangerous I know it's easy time. He, like, he, okay, now this is really important because, again, like, this is the part of the interview where he's basically giving the green light to crazy people to take this into your own, own hands and do whatever it is you think you have to do. Because these people will stop at nothing. He's making an enemy out of skeptics. He's making an enemy out of Arrow. He's making an enemy out of lawmakers. He's making an enemy out of anyone who does not believe this narrative. This is the stuff that is insanely insidious. And it's, um, to me, I don't know. Again, I hope there's fucking consequences for shit like this. Because the the fact that a new it's something called News Nation is letting this guy uh, spread the bullshit that he's spreading is absolutely wild. These are desperate people. They are concealing. I, I mean, I know it's easy to be flippant about this, but they are concealing crimes, evil crimes. I, I wish I could say more. I mean, I'm evil crimes. You can say more. You have so many sources that you could reveal these programs where they are. You could reveal the ship so big it can't be moved. You could reveal that without revealing or compromising one source. And nobody's going to care, to be honest with you, because if you're the journalist that shows that to the world, you instantly overnight become the most credible, the most wanted person on the planet for the next ever <laughs> forever until the day you die you think in plain sight sold good numbers your next book the craft not the movie the 90s movie with uh with all those pretty girls in it the craft so large that it can't be moved and a building had to be built around it, although that title is too long. So we're just going to call it the craft for the book. Everybody tracking here? Okay, let's listen to the rest of this. I am truly shocked that oh. American democracy has come to this. This son there of a is bitch. A stain on American democracy. There's a stain on American democracy. So fuck off back to fucking Australia or New Zealand or wherever the fuck you come from. It's an American news company giving you a fucking paycheck. It's an American audience that is fucking giving you a job. Fuck you. You are the stain on American democracy because you are wreaking havoc within the intelligence community. You penile piece of shit. <laughs> I'm like, give me a fucking break, Ross Coldheart. The ball's on you. He's telling people that they're committing crimes so heinous, he can I just don't even want to talk about him. That goes back 50, 60, 70 years. Yeah, It is an sure. unresolved issue within the entire national security complex that has never been properly addressed. It's a cancer. It's, a it's going cancer. to be cut out. And there's bipartisan agreement on this. And what's interesting is the gatekeepers are getting nervous, and so are their foot soldiers. You are a gatekeeper? Matt Ford is your foot soldier, and so are all of the other idiots around you, underneath you, and above you. The Council of fucking dunces. The balls on this guy, man. The absolute balls on this guy. Um... So I, I can't, I don't have time to get into this. Uh, <laughs> I haven't even read it myself, so I don't 100% know what this is all about. But I wanted to just really quickly highlight Daniel Sheehan um, and his bullshit and his crazy stuff that he's been pushing lately. Um, okay, so there was a video that he had put out, and I wanted to watch that because it was, okay, here it is. 
Oh, no, this isn't it. Ugh, God, no, I definitely don't want to watch that shit. Okay, so yeah, so here's his little fucking promo for the Romero Institute in front of a church asking you for money so they can fight the good UFO fight on your behalf. In Washington, D.C. I'm reaching... My name is Danny Sheehan. I'm the president of the New Paradigm Institute in Washington, D.C. I'm reaching out to you now to ask you to volunteer to become a member of Citizens for Disclosure. We're going to be organizing 435 action teams around the country. Please contact us at newparadigminstitute.org. Thank you. This is how unprofessional this is. First of all, I don't know who the fuck dresses Danny Sheehan, but Jesus Christ, fine. The guy's got a fashion, okay, cool. But at least mic him up properly. I know it's a TikTok and I know it's a viral thing, but if you want people to give you money, maybe don't have cawing fucking crows in the background with the mic from the phone that you're filming it on. Maybe actually lav him up and get some good sound there. Uh, maybe frame him a little better. I mean, look at this, dude. Look how much headroom there is. I, I just... Like, the production, the producer in me is going crazy right now. Absolutely nuts. <laughs> like, Jesus Christ, man. Who advises you maniacs? Like, for real. Okay, so let's get to... Uh, no, 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 where'd it go? It's funny, I was watching the big phone home or two because uh, somebody was asking me about it and they wanted a clip from it, uh, which I think will be relevant here soon. Um, let me see here, where did Danny Sheehan go? Okay, oh, okay, yeah, we're on it. Um, okay, so there was a interview that dropped today. Uh, from good old Ross Colthart on his new show. Let's go ahead and get this on the YouTube side of things. Um, on his new show called, uh, what is this bullshit called? Some stupid name. Reality Check with Ross Colthart. <laughs> Look at this Muppet. Look at this Muppet, everyone. Reality Check with Ross Colthart. Uh, here he is with David Grush. Here he is with, I don't know, some guy in overalls. So the very first, this is the premiere. Okay, and it had 10,000 people. The 1.18 million subscribers on News Nation tuned in. 10,000 people tuned in to watch this live. I don't think it was live. I think it was a pre, it was an edited interview. Um... And it's funny because, <laughs> what does he call him? Not Kirkpatrick. He calls him, uh, I don't know. Danny Sheen doesn't get Kirkpatrick's name right so many times, but yet he sat down with an interview with him. But listen, we watch this. Uh, oh, by the way, um, the fair use. I'm going to go ahead and include the link. Oh, God, I don't want to do that. But I'm going to, we're going to include the link for this stupid show in the video details below. So if after the show, you want to go watch this whole interview, um, and I promise you, you don't, uh, we're going to do some of it for you here. So you don't have to, but the link is in the live stream. Uh, fair use. Um, this is transformative work. We are sharing and critiquing the videos we are talking about here, and this is covered under fair use and allowable by law. Uh, wait, did I hear Lou right? Sheehan was in an interview with Kirkpatrick or something? No, 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 no. Ker Sheehan was in an interview with Ross Colthart, and they talked about Kirkpatrick, and he got Kirkpatrick's name wrong many times. But Sheehan was supposedly, according to Sheehan, one of the interviewees, one of the 40 of witnesses that in the aero office interviewed and basically was like yeah we checked those things out and they didn't check out and obviously danny sheehan did not like the answers to that so um anyway well hello ladies and gentlemen and welcome to this inaugural episode of reality check 
a new program yeah. here on News Nation no that's going stamps, to unfortunately. into the issues that you and I care about. One of those issues, of course, is the subject of unidentified anomalous phenomena, UAPs. Uh, I wonder what else they're going to dive into on this show. Loch Ness Monster? Oh, did they? Okay, no, it's still an hour long. Okay, so there was... Um, okay, so there's a few things in this interview, and I'm sure at some point people are going to highlight these things, uh, and then, or maybe we'll get a timestamp, but... There was a, a few things that Danny Sheehan said here that were incredibly interesting. One was the story, and hopefully we got it queued up. And he's told this story on my show as well about how he got to see this top secret classified UFO information. But let's see if this uh, is, this is the, it. Uh, President Carter was elected like on November 4th of 1976. And right by the 19th of November, even before he'd been sworn in, one of the first things he did is he sent a word to have the CIA director, uh, come down to Plains, Georgia, to his home uh, and brief him personally at his home <laughs> about the UFO issue and his potential relationship to any extraterrestrial civilization. It turns out that the CIA director at that time was George H.W. Bush, who was later to become president. Uh, but at that time, he had been appointed by the, 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 new, the new president, Gerald Ford, who had just taken over from Nixon, having resigned due to the Watergate burglary scandal, uh, and George H.W. Uh, George Bush refused to give him the information. Uh, the, George Bush told him that as the elected president, he had no reason to know uh, this information. Uh, he, he said that if, in fact, uh, uh, Carter was willing to keep him on as his CIA director uh, so that he could become permanently the CIA director, that uh, he might be willing to tell him about this. But, uh, but President Carter did not. And uh, so what President Carter did is instead he contacted the Congress and said, look, at the Congress uh, needs to be involved in this. And he asked the Science and Technology Committee of the House of Representatives to contact the Congressional Research Service uh, and to have them pro uh, produce two major reports for the president. One on the probabilities and likelihood of there being an extraterrestrial civilization. And secondly, whether it might be responsible for at least some of the sightings of the UFOs. Uh, and I was contacted by Marsha Smith, who was the director of the Congressional mm. Research Service Science and Technology Division, okay. and asked to become special counsel to that investigation because I was at the Jesuit National Headquarters. I was their general counsel in their social ministry office, which was their public policy office. So can I just take you then uh, very quickly to what happened? You, you uh, I'm going to tell this in a rough, quick form. Yeah. As I understood Here it, you insisted on being given access to the hitherto unreleased, secret unreleased Project Blue Book files. And incredibly, they agreed to do that. You were Listen given access because this was a presidential fiat. And as a result of that, and I took great pleasure the other day, I was walking back from a bar near Congress, and I stood at the Madison building, the very same building where you were given entry before it was even officially opened. Tell me what happened that day when you went to the Madison building in the National Archives. What happened? Well, what happened is uh, uh, Marsha Smith had told me that I had to bring two forms of official photo ID. So I brought my Washington, D.C. driver's license uh, and I brought my passport. Uh, and I came to the building. Uh, I was surprised that uh, it, nobody had even occupied the building yet. It was brand new. It had just gotten built. And there were these two suits uh, standing outside of the door waiting for me. Uh, they demanded to see both forms of my identification. Uh, and I showed them both. And, uh, and I, then they showed me in. So I went into the hallway. And they said, go down the hallway to the right. And you'll see an elevator there on the left. And you go down uh, into the basement. Uh, and you'll see the place to go. So I went in, I got in the elevator, uh, and I went down. And as I was going down the elevator, I just, on instinct, I just opened up my briefcase and took out a yellow pad uh, and slipped it under my arm and then closed my briefcase. The, the, the elevator arrived in the basement. Uh, I got out, and it was dark down there. There weren't lights on, I, but I could see down the hall. Uh, I could see a light uh, coming out of a room, and there were these two other So suits, spooky. These guys. Uh, big kind of husky looking guys uh, that were there. So I go down the hallway 
uh, they both demanded, both of them demanded to see my two forms of identification. Uh, it was sort of like they resented my even being there. Uh, and so, but I showed them uh, and they said, look, uh, leave that briefcase here. You, you, you can't uh, take any notes. You can't uh, record anything. Uh, but here the, here the stuff is they brought the stuff for you. And so I went, I put the suit, the briefcase down. Yes. So I just want to set the scene for this. This is you, Daniel Sheehan, yeah. being given access to uh -huh. the darkest, deepest secrets in the American military industrial complex. It's literally the darkest, de deepest room, but I don't think the secrets are dark and crazy. Okay, so the information that Danny Sheehan saw, was it significant? Does this sound like a super classified setting in which a a person is going to get the biggest secrets on the planet. Yeah, yeah, just go down the hallway down there and yeah, there's an elevator and you go down to the basement and you'll see your, you'll find it. And then you get down to the basement, there's no fucking lights on, but you see two big husky dudes and they both ask you for your uh, two forms of identification. Wow. What a security check. Okay, pal, looks like, yeah, this guy's Danny Sheehan, all right. Yep, hair matches on this one and this one. All right, I guess we'll let you in because they're making us, you know? And then you go in the room and what happens? Because I want to paint the picture, really, of what's happening here rather than these two schmucks. Complex. You've asked for and been given access to the UFO files, the secret files of Project Blue Book, the files the government denies exists. What did you find? Oh. Well, what I did is I walked in and I was in this, this a comparatively small room. It was about maybe 20 feet wide and about 12 feet or so deep. And there were these uh, three big uh, cardboard fold out tables. <laughs> uh, and they had uh, like shoe boxes, these little light green kind of government green uh, shoe boxes uh, with the little ties on them. Uh, and there was a microfiche machine that was there. Uh, and so I, I sat down uh, and I took the, the yellow pad out and I slid it over behind one of the boxes. So if they looked in, they wouldn't see it. Uh, and I, I opened up the first box and, I, and they had these little uh, film canisters uh, of microfiche film. Uh, so I took the first one out and I put it into the uh, this old timey microfiche machine and started cranking it and looking at it. it was all these documents and I was I said I don't know how long they're going to allow me to stay in here uh, and so I said if I start reading each one of these documents as a lawyer it's going to take forever so I sort of cranked through them to, uh, to see if there were any photographs anywhere and nothing was there in the first canister and so I, t I folded it all up and put it back in and I opened up a second canister went through it and they had a lot of documents again. This is so this is just so stupid. Like, first of all, if they allow you access to this kind of information and the president of the United States is the one who organized this for you, you don't get rushed through this. You can sit there for as long as you fucking want and digest the information as it comes to you because you are there you by a requirement of law. It's not, okay, go in the room and I don't know how much time you have, so get through as much of it as you can. Oh, and don't take notes, even though we let you sneak in there with a pad. So no one pat them down, no one no one checked them for microphones or uh, you know, uh, some sort of equipment to copy the information. They just let them see this top secret shit. You're gonna believe that, anyone out there, okay. Let's continue. I can see all the official uh, stamps on them and, and the top secret uh, designations, et cetera. And then I, I got to the third canister, I think it was, and par part way in, there it was. Here was this series of photographs, uh, black and white photographs of a crashed flying saucer. Wasn't any doubt about what it was. It was a winter scene. Uh, there was snow on the ground and the, the saucer, it was a classic a uh, large disc saucer about 40, 50 feet across with a big dome on the top of it. And it had hit into this snow-covered field and it plowed this big ditch all the way across the field. Like the earth was all turned up and it was stuck into the side of the uh, this big snow-covered embankment, stuck in there like at a 45 degree angle, just stuck in the side of the, the hill. Uh, and I could see all around it, there were these Air Force personnel 
they were in winter jackets, you know, with the big fur around the hood, and uh, and they and they were uh, t taking photographs of it. And I actually saw one of the guys in one of the photos. There were like three of them that I saw the photos, and they had one of these uh, old timey cameras, a movie camera, like with the two big round canisters on the top of them. So it must have been like in like the late forties or early fifties or something. I, I figured, and so that. I, and then all of a sudden, I realized that in one of the photos, I could see around the bottom of the dome of the, the, the crash saucer that was stuck in the embankment, these symbols. And I, I looked at them and I said, wow, look at those. You know, they're, they're, there's nothing like anything I've ever seen. They're not Russian. They're not Chinese. They're not, you know, uh, hieroglyphics. There's not, they're totally unique. Uh, so I said, okay, I'm going to trace these because I want to make sure they're absolutely identical to what is there and that they're in the exact sequence that they're in. And so I did as I took these out the yellow. These are, these, are top, these are top secret files, Danny. Isn't that an act of espionage? Well, no, I'd, I'd been cleared to see them. Uh, and so, so what <laughs> I did is I, I took out the yellow pad, and interestingly enough, uh, it's just one of those instinctive things, I opened up the yellow pad to the inside cardboard backing. Uh, and what I did is I pushed the backing uh, underneath the, the microfiche machine and then focused the, the microfiche right onto the inside back inside cover of the yellow pad so that I could I, I trace them identically, uh, absolutely, totally accurately, every single one of them. And there must have been about uh, to eight or ten of them that were all obvious. Uh, so I could and I trace them in detail. And okay, I got them all so done. I kept looking up to see. Here's, if here's what's great is he told this exact same story right here on the big phone home. And we asked him <laughs> to draw it out. All right, folks, welcome back. Today we have a massive golf Whoa. course community yard sale. You've actually never been to this neighborhood before. No. But the houses look us. Uh, this is the goal. This is the guy. I love watching this. This guy goes around the uh, garage sales and finds really cool uh, used golf equipment. It's great. Him and his wife. They're the cutest little thing in the whole world. Um, okay, yeah. So we lost our place here in this uh, in this Sheehan shit show. But that's okay because it ended right on the perfect spot. So this is what I wanted to show you guys. So this is the Big Phone Home 2, Day 3. Okay, <laughs> this is an eight hour, 41 minute stream that I have since taken down because of this propaganda bullshit that I did not want to share. But this is the only show, the only place as far as I know where Danny Sheehan has actually shown what the symbols looked like on the on the craft that he saw a picture of. So let's watch this. Oh, yeah. I don't know if you can see this. Let me see here. Where where, where am I here? Yeah, yeah. Uh, just put, pop, prop it up. There okay. you go. Yeah. See, uh, let me. I'll, I'll show you. I'll show you exactly what they look like. But I don't know what the sequence is. I don't remember the exact sequence they were in. But they were they were like this. How could you not remember what sequence they're in? Like, why wouldn't course, you? My guess was because I, I drew some eat stuff, that thing. Like... Oh, what did you draw it? Okay. What does that mean, Andy? I'll tell you later. <laughs> uh, I think I know. That's what me and Andy oh, were what friends. do you think it is, Jade? Well, I don't know. I want to give anything away, but... Can you see it? Uh, yeah, lift here it we up go. Just a little... Yeah, okay. You see this? Yeah, a little... Uh... So, there you go. Those are the symbols that Danny Sheehan said are not Japanese, not Russian. They're, they're not any language I've ever seen in my whole life. How do you know it's language? How do you know? Someone posted a screenshot on Reddit because they were taking his course. That's great. So funny. You know, like, this is, like, yes. I mean, somebody said, like, oh, yeah, uh, copy Roswell. <laughs> you know, like, it kind of does look like a, uh, a copy and paste of the Roswell shit that Jesse Marcel claims to have seen. Um, But, yeah, I mean, like, this is... This was such a good look at this panel, dude. We had Jamarl Thomas, Gary Voorhees, John Greenwald, UFO Jane, Andy McGrillan, myself, and Rather. What a fucking lineup, dude. Like, god damn, we were putting on such a cool show. Um, I mean, we're the only show that got Danny Sheen to actually draw this shit out for anybody. You know, and like 
the fact that he had it on a notepad and he didn't save that notepad boggles my mind. Boggles my mind. Like that he doesn't have that thing framed. You know, like it was so important to him. And there's so many things in this interview that are very similar to 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 this, where it's just like, oh, come, come on, man. Like, you know, he's talking about um all sorts of stuff where if and and I'm gonna I've already seen the whole interview, but I'll I'll find the moments once I saw this interview, I was like, dude, I gotta talk about this interview because this is just stupid. Um and sort of the claims that Sheehan makes all the time. Like it's just it's enough. Enough is enough already. <laughs> like like you guys need to be aware of this. But I think the most cringeworthy part was the very end here. This little, this fucking, and, and first, before we get off of Sheehan here, look at the books here, the Jesuits, UFOs, and the natural uh, security state. Uh, a book called Worldview. Like, all of these hippie crystal fucking transcending books. Like, this guy is a believer. He's always been a believer, hook, line, and sinker. And I think he's always been insanely gullible and a useful idiot. And I think the meeting that he was invited to as a part of this council was literally the government being like, dude, literally, just fucking put him in a room in a government building, tell him it's top secret, have him show you a couple IDs, and we'll put a whole bunch of bullshit in the manila folders or the, the shoe boxes, and he'll come out even more of a believer than when he walked in. And he'll tell this Lord, he'll tell this story for the rest of his life and it doesn't make any sense why would our government show danny sheehan this in a non-compartmentalized situation that does not make any sense no matter what era it is nobody just <laughs> oh down the hallway with no lights and two mysterious gentlemen and all i need is two forms of id excellent you guys aren't gonna pat me down cool like it's so stupid it's so so dumb being such a program uh that is transparently lying danny sheehan thank you very very much for that analysis there you have it ladies and gentlemen we have a constitutional crisis we have a constitutional crisis we have a direct threat stupid. to control by congress they are literally whipping up. This is the kind of language you use when you're trying to start a revolution. When you're trying to get people to, to act outside of the norms of the system because the system norms, according to them, don't work for them anymore. They're invalid. There's a constitutional crisis. The constitution is in danger. So what are we gonna do? What would our forefathers do? What are you gonna do, Mr. Alien Believer with an AK-47 or a, you know, AR-15 sitting in his house somewhere? What are you gonna do? These guys are hiding these secrets from you. Of everything that happens inside the US government. I mean, honestly, I would not be surprised if this this jerk is being is a paid disinformation asset of like a Russia, China, some one of one of our not our allies, our enemies, one of our enemies to 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 create chaos within the intelligence agency and within our our American uh, democracy and how it works and just just throwing wrenches into the system so people are paying attention to bullshit as opposed to really paying attention to the things that actually matter but listen to how he shills for a profit egregious flagrant alleged breaches of the u.s constitution a challenge to the whole notion of separation of powers what about separation of church and state you freak show what about that what about that ross colthart separation i'd love to separate you from anything having to do with the united states forever you should be banned in this country as far as i'm concerned do americans give a flying hoot I don't know if they do, but Daniel- No, they don't. They don't give a flying fuck, Ross Coulthart. Well, Sheehan and his colleagues at New Paradigm Institute 
are going to give it a go. He's getting on the saddle yet again for another confrontation with the national security state. And if you'd like to help him, if you'd like to get behind Citizens for Disclosure, get in touch with the new Paradigm Institute. This is a very well worthwhile it is not a well worthwhile effort. I'm not even going to play the rest of this because I don't want to. I don't want anybody to, <laughs> to know uh, where to fucking donate to these profits of profit. These these wank stains of truth. Um, constitutional crisis. Some fucking Aussie's going to tell us that we're having a constitutional crisis, yet he's sitting on information that can change the world right now, right now. He wants you to, to stone to death. He wants you to drag people. He wants bodies to hit the floor. There's a constitutional crisis and he's calling you to do something about it. This smug, stupid asshole The, the the gumption that this dick has. I hope there are consequences for this shit. I really do. I really, really do. I can't believe News Nation is is well I can. I mean they're a shitty new they're not a news network. I don't, and they're they're owned by the same company that owns George Knapp's network and owns the Weaponized Podcast Network. Like all of this shit falls under one very strange, shitty umbrella, uh, corporate umbrella, and it's um, I think it is literally created to create chaos, confusion, and narrative building, uh, to to serve only those in power. Or the enemies of those in power. In other words, our our government. This is like a Russia uh, today. An RT news nation is like Russia today. <laughs> but it's got the American colors on it. And it's, it's... I genuinely think this is a dangerous entity now. At this point. And, and I've and I've listened to other reports that they've had on other shit. It's it it's clear which way they lean. It is clear which way uh, this news network delivers its news. And they just if the cadre of of bottom of the barrel journalists that they've hired at this entity doesn't tell you enough, I don't know what will. I don't know what will, but it is a collection of literally the worst journalists. Journalists, I use that very loosely, uh, that have ever been assembled in the history of news. So, yeah, that's what happened today. And there's other stuff that's happened, but honestly, I don't give a shit. <laughs> I don't want to talk about it today. I got other stuff that I want to do. Um... But I had to, I like just listening to Ross Coulthard for the last three days and sort of this uh, call to arms. It's a call to arms. It's insulting to me. And I, I will not idly stand by and let some fucking Aussie talk shit about American veterans, about the American system that is democracy in our republic. Uh, the American intelligence infrastructure and and that system. I, as much as I don't trust our government, I trust Ross Coulthard even fucking less, even less. And it's almost like one of those moments where, hey, I'm only allowed to beat the shit out of my little brother. You dickhead or not, because you're not in this family. You're not American. You don't have any fucking skin in this game and as far as i'm concerned as an american citizen it's concerning to me and insulting to me that you think you are the fucking know-it-all and the expert and the only 
one smart enough in the room in the journalistic spectrum that has the brains to cover this and then turn around, insult our American democracy, insult our soldiers, and call for people to be stoned to death and dragged behind Humvees for all to see the crimes that they've committed against not only the American public, but humanity as a whole. Fuck you, Ross Coulthart. Fuck you. Fuck you, Ross Coulthart. And everyone else that is an American citizen that gives a shit about standing up for your fucking country. <laughs> like, like, these guys are attacking it in such a unique and scummy way. And I, again, I pray that there are consequences for people like Ross Coulthard doing this shit. Because I'm telling you right now, if somebody goes into a lawmaker's office or a function or or a scientist or, or, or a member of Arrow gets hurt, and in that interview they ask, hey, why did you do this? Well, Ross Coulthard said that it was a crime against American democracy and our constitution. It's a constitutional crisis. What else was I supposed to do? You fucking sicken me, man. Like, it's genuinely, I find you grosser and yuckier by the second. He's doing some genuine damage. Especially to the intelligence community. The havoc that this man and his reporting are causing. Unreal, dude. Unreal. The balls, man. This is the guy that they sent out. This guy. Anyway, yeah, that's the show. Ah, uh, such a terrible taste in my mouth that this guy leaves me. But what can I do? What can I do? Just laugh at it. Yeah, SCU keynote speaker. <laughs> this guy. You guys, seriously, if you agree with me, if you think anything that I'm saying is hitting the right note, share this fucking show. Share the shit out of this show. Share the shit out of every episode we do. Because this stuff's got to stop. <laughs> well, it's never going to stop. But the, we are going, this show will be the fucking landmass that this wave of bullshit crashes upon. I don't care. I'll be I'll be the brunt of that shit wave. No problem. No problem cuz it's so easy. It's so easy. Mm. Mm, mm, mm. Unbelievable. What did I expose? Ah, nothing that nobody really didn't know. You know, other than Ross Coulthard, it's a complete asshole. Uh, but go back, watch the show. We we'll see how I get there. Um, just gross, man. Oh, I'm looking at his stupid face right now. And yeah, I've you've turned me off so much that I almost never want to listen to your voice again. And I love your voice. That's the part that kills me. Anyway, you guys, thank you all for being here. Thank you for the uh, super chats that we got in today. You think he's on a watch list? I hope he is. I hope he is on a watch list because he's asking for Americans to be killed because UFO secrets are being held by gatekeepers. So yeah, I hope so. I hope so. And I love Aussies. That's the part that kills me, man. Really, really do. 
most Aussies, any Aussie I've ever met in my life, but he's not Aussie, he's from New Zealand. But he, it doesn't matter, either one. Both sides, I have nothing but wonderful people. He's the least palatable person I've met from either region. Mm. Archangel Reese, Torso B. Baker, Bobby Broadway, Simon Fly, hiding in a mug, wax paper, Smith, Moondust, Pat Calabria, Swing McCloud, Jason Brown, Wise Monkey, thank you all so damn much. I love you all. Seriously, what a fun show. Um, thank you so damn much, all of you, for being here. Um, please don't forget to smack that like, share, subscribe, and ring the bell. That way you're notified anytime this show goes live. You are aware of it. Uh, and we do lives. We don't have a schedule here. So best thing to do is ring that bell, baby. I uh, want to uh, say thank you to, again, all of the Patreon members out there and all of the people who sent in Super Chats. If you truly do love the show, uh, no paywalls, no extra information, no extra shows, no, no extra anything. Just if you really love the show, check out our Patreon link. It's in the description below. All of the videos that we talked about today, the links are also in the description, so check them out if you want to listen to the whole interview. Um, and yeah, I think that's everything, you guys. Um, thank you for embarking on this journey of discovery together. Stay curious, stay skeptical, and thank you for subscribing to Lou Reviews and helping us raise the bar with each episode that we do. All right, you guys, have a wonderful rest of your week. We'll see you soon. Peace out.